All right. Good morning, Libby. Live out of the Brunswick Community Garden. How are you? I'm great. Thanks, Lena. Thanks for having me here today. Yeah, <laughs> I'm very excited. Um, so, yeah, you are um, a volunteer slash leading the community garden um, in Brunswick, Mornings in Melbourne. And um, yeah, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about you? Yeah. Um, so I'm Libby. I am the president, sounds more fancier than it is, <laughs> of an organisation called Moreland Community Gardening, which is um, an organisation that uh, it's kind of a bit of a story to it, but essentially we um, are like an umbrella organisation to be able to allow gardens and spaces to be incorporated have insurance and be a legal body. So we have West Brunswick Community Garden, which is where I am today, um, the Food Forest in Dunstan Reserve and Pentridge Community Garden in um, Pentridge, <laughs> in Coburg. And um, yeah, I, I work for a women's leadership organisation. And so this is my part-time volunteer gig, sometimes more than part-time, but uh, I really love and I'm really passionate about community gardening and community and gardening and connection. <laughs> yeah, I love community garden. Um, I would love if you could um, say a bit, what is actually a community garden, you know, and how, um, yeah, how um, is it operating? And also how can people get involved as well if they would like to? So community gardens come in lots of shapes and sizes. There's not one fixed definition, I think. Uh, I think the, the broadest scope of it is where you get a group of passionate people that are interested in gardening together and connecting with each other around gardening. So there's lots of really great examples all across um, Moreland. We've got our little pocket community gardens um, that have started out like Balecki Beck. We've got Seeds, which I know you've been involved with, which is associated with an organisation. Many of our neighbourhood houses have associated community gardens or food forests. And then there's larger gardens as well, like ours, like Faulkner Food Bowls that um, have, have really different models. So most Moreland community gardens have a, um, a percentage of their space that's communal so people can garden together and share the produce learn from each other really great space to get involved in as particularly if you're new to gardens um, we have personal plots at our gardens apart from the food forest and um, so that way people can have their own little space that they garden in we still have lots of people sharing the produce and then we have all the other space that's kind of here, the fruit trees and all those sorts of things that we care for. And I think whenever I reflect on community gardens and I get to do quite impassioned speeches at our AGMs and all sorts of things, really the most uh, significant thing for me is community. It's not, I think many of our members are connecting with us because they're looking for a space to connect with other people. Um, around a shared interest. And if you're not into to footy or, I don't know, soccer or, or the library or who knows, there, it offers another um, third space. You, you know, the, the theory of third space, the space within a community that's not your home and not your workplace that you feel safe and connected. And I think that's really important to make lots of those spaces for people. Yeah. So you pretty much, um, it's, it's mostly gardening ab about um, food, yeah? And pretty much yeah. planting edibles. Yes, yes. We, we have some diversity in both gardens. So the, um, both gardens have native garden spaces and, um, and kind of beneficial insect type planting. So, you know, flowers and, and the like, but predominantly food growing, yes. Yeah. So we've got a lot of zucchinis right now. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That's what we had in our garden. It's just a, a zucchini seem to be abundant. Yeah. Keep yes. on giving. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it's really beautiful because I really like it to um, people come together gardening and also 
so much knowledge together you know like um from different people and yeah absolutely absolutely i don't think there's a person that hasn't bought a new idea or a new crop to it to the space when they're coming to join um so yes that and and i think you also learn things sharing knowledge i've been doing this for more than 10 years and so feel you know pretty confident and there's not a there, there's not a day that goes past that somebody doesn't ask a curly question that I have to go and find out or learn with them about what the answer is and what the solution is so it's a an opportunity to keep learning and keep growing so it's pretty much like people um so how does it work like people can it's obvious it's like um council owned and pretty much people yeah. there's no it's private, is it <laughs> no. private land so, where the community so, garden we, is? so pentridge is private land and west brunswick is on council land so we have a, a lease or license agreement with those bodies to to utilize the space so essentially it's um run by us as an organization um and people can get involved so at we have a website, which moorlandcommunitygardening.org.au. Um, you can go on there. It'll connect you, take you through the process of becoming a member. You can become just a friend of. So you can become a friend of a garden, which means that you can visit the garden. You get to know the people, get invited to events, all those sorts of things. You can become a communal garden member, which is usually a, a fairly low fee over a year um, to be able to join in that communal gardening space the fee helps cover things like seeds and and you know manure for the soil and mulch and those sorts of things and share produce and it, it's it's very very um in terms of how much you get to take away to versus how much money you put in it's a really um really great value uh proposition and then there is uh, plots so most of our gardens work on a waiting system for plots so you put your name down and when one comes free they're offered to you know people on the list amazing and so this th this is then by a yearly fee that you could use as plot is that correct yes yeah correct yeah yeah amazing um so yeah. if i just come tomorrow and i just want to get involved i could just come at several days when someone is there i think you guys are there on friday mornings and then i can just pick your brains and, and learn about plants and seeds and growing and absolutely and take my knowledge away yeah. and use it in my own garden so absolutely yeah. absolutely so both our gardens have regular working bees when anybody from the community can come and connect because the gardens are open and um and then once you're a member you can come down and and use the space we have we've in the past had people become members and just come and sit here and do their work because it's a beautiful space to be um uh so you know the the use isn't limited to gardening it's we've, we've got a couple of members that come for a cup of tea <laughs> um and that's great because it, it makes the garden feel alive and it benefits the community. So I'm just going to turn that phone off. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. This must have been the editing part now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, gonna... We were just talking about editing, just so you know. <laughs> um, amazing. Um, and so today we also want to talk about composting um, yes because this is do. like i love composting and i love worm farms and i think everyone should have either worm farm or a compost um because it's so easy but if they can't they should join a community garden because yes. they have space for you to compost exactly. your but even Absolutely. if you live in an apartment building, maybe you can change some bits. Like I asked my neighbors the other day because we need it more actually for the compost because I have so many worms. And they said, oh, we do have a compost in our um, courtyard. And I'm like, how amazing is this? And they're like 15 apartments or something. And I'm like, this is incredible that you guys have a compost. I'm so happy. Um, yes. Because I was talking with my friend the other day because um, even if we have this green bins now, 
there's still so much fossil fuel involved because of the trucks that have to pick up uh, the compost and then it needs to travel 20k somewhere and and all sorts of things and if we're going to put this in our normal bin it creates a lot of um biogas but this is what you can tell us now so um yeah do you want to talk about uh, yeah just the abundance of composting <laughs> <laughs> um Compost is amazing. Compost is like living, wonderful uh, opportunity, I reckon. It's, um, so we have a really large compost system here at West Brunswick and uh, can, can process most of their green waste from the garden. And we have members that, that just come to drop off their compost. Um, and it, so we, we, from all sorts of different surface areas, we get different amounts of soil, manure, all those sorts of things. One of the things about compost is it's alive. So it is a living, breathing entity that when you add it to soil, just makes soil amazing. And it gives so much opportunity for water retention and growth. I think people are really, um, nervous about compost sometimes you know there, there's a big perception that it'll attract rats there's uh there's a you know the perception that it smells occasionally it does but not that bad and it generally means you just need to add some sawdust um there is a bit of a balance to it you know you and if I can get Richard to come in he is here um he can he can do the whole spiel but um getting the balance right between kind of dry and, and wet or, or carbon and not carbon or something is, is important. So, you know, if you're doing a home compost, making sure that if you're adding lots of veggie matter, you throw in some straw or paper, put all your serviettes and paper towel that you use in it. The, these all help balance out the, the, the smells and keep the, the levels dry so I have a small home compost system we don't do very much with it at all like in terms of you know we're not out there forking it every week we've never had rats and we've never had um like smells that are at all noticeable or flies or anything just kind of keep going with layers put it in let the grass clippings dry out and then add those um it, it's and it, it is like just amazing for gardens but it's also amazing as you say for the for the environment taking that that out of our waste stream makes a massive contribution to reducing our footprint and our impact on the planet so do it do it <laughs> and there are lots of options as you were saying for apartments and um little you know whether it's bakashi bins or the little like ones that you can put in a planter bed. Um, yeah, there's there's all sorts of different ways. And I know at the moment, Moreland Council, I just saw an ad for it, so hopefully it's still running, um, have a discount on worm farms and compost bins. So if you're a Moreland resident, get on the on the website and where they out up. at Bunnings. No, I don't know. So they I waste compost you were just lost for a minute <laughs> oh we dropped out yeah um sorry so what was that like um moreland city council you you just have a look on their homepage. yeah okay yeah have a look on the home page and kind of type compost or something in and, okay. and i'm sure it'll come up cool. um great so let's let's start okay i have no idea of composting right and i've heard of it <laughs> and now i'm like cool i just want to become more environmentally friendly and so i just want to have a compost so what what's what's your advice on um how do i start this whole thing you know because what we just talked about the last five minutes is like because we know how compost works but if i have no clue where do i even start you know where am i looking yeah. what what compost bin can you let's just talk about compost bins? <laughs> so there's there's different forms of compost bins. You've got your rolling ones, you've got your 
Dalek type ones that just sit on the ground. You've got more elaborate systems that are available. But essentially the whole idea of compost is that compost needs three things. It needs the your fresh kind of veggie scraps. It needs some carbon fixing type stuff like paper or straw or sawdust, and it needs air. So putting those three things together, you end up with a beautiful compost. To start at home, the best thing to do is to start collecting your vegetable waste, making sure that as you collect it, just chop it up. So when I, you know, chop the tops off the carrots, I just chop, 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 keep things in small pieces. They'll break down faster and you'll have less problems. I have a bowl on my bench that I take out every day. Some people have little bins, however it works for you in terms of collecting and then take it out. Now you can do the old fashioned way as well. If you don't want to have a bin in your garden that, you know, my grandpa used to dig a little shallow hole in the ground and he'd fill, fill it up with compost for the week and then fill that in. And so compost is really flexible. It can work with whatever system that you have and whatever kind of, stuff you've got around um, and then it's just a matter of adding giving it a fork or you can buy compost turners to kind of drill down particularly into the Daleks which are quite hard once they're really full to get the air in but just to be able to loosen and get some air because what's happening in compost is that you're growing bacteria and fungi in there as things break down that are that are eating up and processing the um the waste and turning it into soil, well, into compost. And the they need air, they need food, they need a bit of water as well. So it needs to be a bit wet, aired. It's it's sometimes hit and miss. Like, you know, I think it's one of those things that you you learn as you go as well. Come and ask questions of people that are experienced, like us at the garden. Or, you know, if you know a friend that's got a good compost system and there's hundreds, if you type into the good, not no longer good karma network, what's happening to my compost? You'll get seven different answers for what you should do to make your compost work. And they're all right because essentially it will work just if you keep a balance and, and put a bit of time in. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's possibly a question on first of all what kind of because I have for example a compost bin that is open on the bottom so yes. the worms can come in themselves and they can go out so which means they're actually not dying in there if they don't have enough food because yeah. worms obviously um, adjust to the food with their population mm -hmm. in a compost same in the worm farm and so um, I found this really good um, to get air in the compost. I found actually learned that it's good to put in between some sticks because that gives it really mm. kind of a looser, you know, because the sticks yep. obviously kind of sticking around. Um, and um, I guess possibly also not put it in the pure sun either. So maybe find a shady spot in your garden. And then I that guess be, that, see, also... that, that can be, that's one of those ones that can be yes or no. So ours okay. in full sun, we cover it with black plastic to, to increase the heat because okay. you have hot and cold compost systems as well. Yeah. So this is where there's no hard and fast rules. The heat can be really beneficial to compost. It can really push the, the process fast, mm -hmm. but you do need to be more attentive. Yeah. Slow or cold compost is much more forgiving of mm -hmm. kind of, you know, yeah. letting it go at its own pace but I guess like um, if you have a closed one and you have worms in there this should definitely not be in the sun right because they mm -hmm. are gonna die in there yeah they're but, gonna get cooked well if it's a compost bin and it's open at the bottom the worms will go down into the soil if it's hot no I'm just meaning if you around. have an enclosed worm farm <laughs> yeah if like you have a, an enclosed farm definitely in the in the shade yeah um okay cool so we can buy this i guess at bunnings or ask for secondhand ones or marketplace so that's where you can get either way a compost bin or a tumbler or worm mm -hmm. farm or worm cafes um they're also really great i think if you were in an apartment because you can put that on the balcony yeah more. um so um yeah the other question is what do you put in a compost? 
That is another it depends question. <laughs> okay. And, it, and it's different between worm farms and compost. Worm farms are a bit more um, uh, hot, like there's certain things you can't put in because worms don't like them, like onions and citrus. Um, and a home, home small compost system will struggle with too much citrus or onions. So if you're making pickled onions and you end up with a pot full of onion refuse, that's going to be really hard for a home compost system to break down. Or if you juice oranges every day for fresh orange juice, you're going to have trouble with your home compost system. But a larger compost system like we have at the community garden, so they're big kind of one metre by one metre squares, we can take everything. So it does depend on the size of your system and also how much energy you're willing to put into it. So your small home compost system, if you're willing to, to fork it really regularly and add enough carbon, will take everything as well. So worm farms, definitely there are things that are, are no-goes. Home compost systems, depending on how much energy you're willing to put in, there are some things that are no-goes. And things like... Um, Bread and meat and dairy can go in a home compost system if, again, if you are willing to put the effort in to, to make sure that it's wet, it's turned, um, or moist, not wet, turned, and um, that you're balancing the, the carbon values. Um, but larger systems can take all of those things and because it all kind of works out there's enough of everything else to balance it so so it's yeah for compost it's all about effort um and if you've got low effort then reduce things high effort you can um i can only hear the people in the background now i know i know <laughs> we might just We've got, it's a working bee going on at the same time. So um, we've got others others coming in and out of the shed. Um, yeah, so, so high effort, put anything in pretty much. You can rip up cotton t-shirts and put them in. Um, anything that will break down, anything that's natural can be composted or large systems or high effort, low effort, probably keep your balances better in terms of, not putting in too much of one thing like citrus or onions and no dairy, meat and bread products um, or only in very small amounts. Yeah, um, maybe we come to the worm farm topic later when we just talk mm -hmm. about the compost. Um, what's the difference between a hot and a cold compost and what's the... Oh, I'm so gonna, Richard, are you gonna come and join me for five minutes? Who are we talking to? This is Lena. Yep. And we're recording yes. a, uh, a session. So this All is right. Richard, our compost king, is going to come and sit with us. Hello. And Hello. Lena. How are you? <laughs> I'm well. You want to talk about composting, hot and cold? Well, yes. essentially, um, hot composting is where you try and um, maintain a, um, the decomposition process as, as, as fast as you can. So the way you do that is you get all of the ingredients in the compost heap that is the the green material which could be anything from lawn clippings to kitchen waste to whatever which has a high uh nitrogen content which is which the microorganisms that do the decomposing require for, to sustain them and also the carbon which is the brown material so that could be um well, it could be anything really but often we add uh, coffee grounds we use of course actual waste material from the garden contains quite a bit of carbon as well. But if you want to add it, we also add sawdust, which is a very good source of carbon. Or you can add ripped up paper. Yes, or... you can use paper. And you've got to be a little bit careful with paper because the um, high gloss colored paper often has printing ink in it, which is not terribly good to add to the garden. But we keep a stock of, uh, of sawdust, which we get from a local uh, joiner who only uses uh, non sort of lethal materials. He doesn't <laughs> use wood that's got oil or paint or so forth on it. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. add coffee, which we get from an organization called Reground, which is which collects coffee grounds from the various cafes. So we get that for nothing. And coffee grounds are actually a very good source of nitrogen. So 
Uh, and we also get what they call the coffee chaff, which is the skin of the coffee bean. When it's roasted, the skin of the green bean splits and it's, it's a very sort of papery material. It has the same, what we call carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, so the same carbon producing and nitrogen producing qualities as the coffee grounds. So they're very similar. And they're a very good additive because also with coffee grounds, because it's granular, it's very small. I mean, the surface area is, um, is very large for per volume. So the idea with fast composting or with hot composting is to get them at the decomposition process to move as quickly as you can by getting all of these ingredients, the carbon producing material, the brown, the um, nitrogen producing material, the green, and also two other ingredients, which are crucial, which are water and oxygen. And that's often where people sort of miss out with their home composting. If you don't, if you don't turn the compost over frequently, um, it gets it, it loses the amount of oxygen that's in there and becomes what we call anaerobic and it often will get really smelly and horrible and you can tell as soon as your compost is a bit pongy it means there's not enough oxygen in there because basically the the decomposition process is very complex um, and involves a lot of microorganisms and uh, uh, fungi and, and bacteria and so forth and you've You've got to feed them essentially. It's it's like if you think of it like an engine, you've got to feed them with the the essential fuel. So nitrogen producing, carbon producing, water, that's very important as well. Because if if the compost heap dries out, then the uh, microorganisms essentially don't have enough water to to survive, yeah. or and they die, and so the whole thing will just stop stop decomposing. So if you if you get the ingredient mix right. And we've got a, a sort of a number of formulas which we use to work out how much of which to add. Um, it's it's a bit of an inexact science. It's not very precise because you're not going to be weighing every uh, you know handful of compost to see how much nitrogen and so forth it's got mm. in it. But you get it roughly right, and it's usually regarded as about thirty of nitrogen producing to one of carbon producing in in terms of weight. As I say, you're not going to weigh it. So if you work on about you know, one handful of, of brown to three handfuls of green, that's sort of very rough formula. And if you get that mixture right, then with a bit of luck, your decomposition process will fire up. And if you've got enough volume, bulk is also important. They say the ideal is about a cubic meter. So if you've got a cubic meter of decomposing material, you can get that temperature up to around 50, 45, 50 degrees, even more. We've had it up to over 60 degrees. And that, what that does um, in, indirectly, I mean, that's the decomposition process, the heat from the decomposition. It, um, it kills off the pathogens and the, and the weed seeds in, in the material you're adding to the compost, which is very valuable. It may not kill them all, but most of them. So we try and push our composting process through fairly quickly. It's usually decomposed pretty much completely within two or three months at the most. The, the other type of composting is pretty much what you see naturally in the forest. You know, if you, if you go into a forest, you'll see all sorts of um, organic material lying one on top of another and it gradually breaks down. And that's a slow process, it might take years. You can do the same thing yourself. You can create a, a heap or a, in some cases on a very large scale, a, what they call a windrow, just piling all the organic material there leaving it there, maybe covering it over with a tarpaulin or something, leaving it for months, if not years, and that will gradually break down naturally. It's, it's just a natural process. Sometimes they do have those very large composting systems where they actually have um, machinery to pump oxygen in and they add water and it's done on a huge scale. That's a, almost an industrial scale. Ours is much smaller, but the principles are all the same. So slow composting is okay, and you can do that at home as well if you if you don't want to go to the trouble of turning it over all the time and adding the the measuring all the various ingredients. But it is a much slower process. That'll take months and months to completely break down. So hot composting is is really the ideal if you want to get a good quick result. Hang on, we're just under the flat. You're gone. <laughs> So I'll, I'll just repeat that. So hot composting is the best, uh, the best technique if you want to get a quick result. 
Um, and it, it, again, it's, it depends on how, really how hard you work at it. I mean, ideally with ours, ours is a big system. We've got five bays and they all hold about one and a half cubic metres when they're full. Um, if we turned them over every day or every couple of days, then that would really be ideal. But it, what tends to happen is it's about once a week. Um, and then after, after a, um, a couple of weeks, we'll move one bay into another and we'll keep moving them along until we, they get to the final, the end point of the process. And then we use that, that compost in the garden. Mm. So that's a quick summary. You can also add some other things. You can add um, animal manures, but you've got to be a bit careful uh, because, for example, chicken manure is very um, hard on plants if it's applied um, fresh. So you need to allow it to break down. So what people often do is just pile it somewhere and wait till it's it's matured a bit before they put it into their compost. Same with other manures. You can use horse manure, cow manure, sheep manure, rabbit manure, any, any animal manure. I wouldn't recommend using um, domestic pet um, droppings though, cat or dog. It can be done, but the problem is people often applying um, uh, you know, various chemicals to their uh, so, uh, medication. medication to their animals, and you don't want that getting into your composting system. So we don't, we don't apply um, animal manures, uh, dog, dog and cat, to ours, uh, but you could, theoretically. Um, similarly, with the, the contents of um, your, the bins, you know, the, the Japanese-style composting bakashi bins which people often have some of our members do bring the contents of their bakashi bins down now that's a different process altogether that's a process which use uses fermentation can you guys move a bit in the picture because i can't see it. Sorry. Um, right. it uses fermentation and the fermentation process involves adding um, some extra ingredient into the mix of household waste it then creates a, a liquid, which often is used as a liquid manure in your garden. And then what people do is take the, the residue, which is the digested material, if you like, um, and put that in the, in the, in the garden. They, they bury it and then it further decomposes. So we do allow some of our members to bring down the contents of their bakashi and put it into our, uh, our, our compost, but it is very acidic. And so you've got to be careful that you don't get get the compost too acidic because plants don't like too much acid. So yeah, but bukashi we do that. is mainly also for animal products, right? That you want to break. Oh down. no, you can put anything in bukashi, oh, okay. yeah, but including animal products. People do put meat in it. That's another reason why we have to be rather careful with it. So if if somebody brings down their bukashi, we make sure a that it's probably probably sorry properly decomposed rather than just sort of raw, um, even if it has animal material, it would usually have broken down. And B, uh, make sure we only add it gradually, not in one great lump. You can also add um, things like um, the commercially available um, chicken pellets, you know, the uh, uh, chicken pelletized, ma pelletized manure. manure, which is fine. It's just like fresh manure, except it's, you can add it as it is. You can add blood and bone, which is the uh, material which is basically comes from animal, animal, um, uh, what do you call it? When, when, the, when the animals are, uh, are killed, they take away the, the blood and the bone and they dry it and, and it's used as a fertilizer, but only very small amounts of those things. Um, so that's, that's really the, the sort of frills, if you like. Um, occasionally, if, if, you're, if your compost uh, becomes very acidic, and you can usually tell when those little vinegar flies are flying around. And it's really smelly. And it's really smelly. Then you need to do something to deacidify it. What people normally do is throw a bit of, of garden lime on it, which is, a, which is very alkaline. So that'll neutralize the acid. You've got to be a bit careful with lime, though, because that can also have a, an adverse effect on your, on your garden if you, if you add it too, too, um, too much. Um, <clears throat> but they're the basics. Um, really, it's a matter of, do, trying it and seeing what works for you and then um, keeping at it. And this is what often happens with home composting. People they start off with great enthusiasm. They might have a compost bin or a compost heap. They're turning it over. They're adding all the right ingredients. And then after a while, they get lazy and they just throw on their kitchen waste, which then starts to get smelly. And then the whole thing gets anaerobic and they can't be bothered turning it over. Mm. 
There's a very good tool you can buy uh, from Bunnings and elsewhere, <clears throat> which looks like a giant corkscrew. And that's really good for turning over your compost. And it works very well in compost bins, <laughs> which are hard to reach down into. I mean, some people just use a fork or even a, a star picket or a stake. But these screws, which is it's basically just a, a la very large metal or steel mm. um, corkscrew, which you can ha do by yourself. And you basically screw it down and then you pull it out like a, pulling out a cork out of a, a bottle. And then you, and you repeat that several times. And that increases the amount of oxygen in your heap. It opens up a bit and it mixes it up, which is a really good way to go. So anybody with a home composting system, I'd recommend getting one of those corkscrews. They're not very expensive. Yeah, I said We've to Libby also, before, yeah. I just like, for example, I have a compost that is open on the bottom and um, yeah. I really learned that like in between I put some sticks in because that really helps yes. to air it. And then I yes. also put all the kind of, um, you know, paper bags where you get like a roll in or something and um, toilet yep. paper rolls and uh, yeah, just anything that is really made from nature and out of organic um, materials so i put that in yeah. and i found this is it, it just works um actually really well on um, yeah. and some even if you put sometimes watermelon and i mean it's really watery so it gives like the compost a nice um you know moisture to it um yes so what do yeah, you I think, think is the awesome yeah sorry go on i was going to say the the secret also is to keep make the material the smallest you can because as, as you, as I mentioned before, what you want to do is to provide the largest surface area you can for the microorganisms to work on. So, for example, if you're putting in something like coffee grounds, that has a huge surface area per, per volume of coffee grounds. If you put in a whole watermelon, um, the surface area is obviously very limited compared with the volume. So we encourage our members to chop up all the material they bring along. Sometimes they forget. And we try and break it down into you know, small pieces, you know, two or three centimetres maximum, and sometimes smaller. And also with stalks of plants too, you, you don't want them to be really thick because they take a long time to break down. Mm. With paper, for example, we use shredded newspaper occasionally, just making sure that it's shredded fairly finely and is not packed in layers, because what tends to happen with the composting process, if the, the paper is in layers, it'll, it'll form a sort of almost like leather and it, it doesn't break down so quickly. So that's yeah. just a, a rule of thumb. Smaller the, the smaller the uh, individual fragments of material, the better. And so Richard, why is it great that we compost and what can we do with um, what we're ending up with? Well, the compost itself is, it's important to realize that it's not soil. Sometimes people think, oh yes, I've created all this new soil for my garden. It's not actually soil. It, it lacks a number, a number of the things which soil has. Soil will often have a lot of clay in it, <coughs> sand in it, um, a lot of other minerals, which perhaps isn't in the compost. I mean, you can add, you can add mineral uh, rock dust, for example, to your compost heap, which does increase the mineral, but that's also expensive to buy. So think of it no, not so much as a substitute for soil, but as an additive. So you're adding. You're adding the um, compost to your soil to um, improve it, if you like. It opens it up. It makes it, <coughs> helps it to hold water better. Um, it obviously adds nutrients, and that's the other important thing. Um, and it's um, going to generally be a soil conditioner. So that's the main, the main thing, the main value of it. And um... Okay, if I live, for example, in an apartment and there is no way I can have a compost, I can have this Bokashi bins, which um, you can put under your sink, which we spoke about already. But um, do you want to um, say a bit about a worm farm or worm cafe? Um, I will. How, I'll, yes. I'll also have to have a cup of coffee soon. <laughs> the very, garden runs on coffee. <coughs> I'm getting very dry in my throat. Do you, want to get you, want me to, you go and get, you go and make an old pause. Okay. The other way of oh, um, I don't think uh, okay. okay, here you go. Yep. The other way of creating um, what I'd call a, a soil conditioner, um, other other words like compost, is of course using a worm farm. And the worm farm can take many different forms. Um, you can buy something called a worm farm, which looks like a little um, tiered plastic um, 
container of different shapes and sizes, but the principles are all the same. Or you can create your own in any container, in a bath or a tub or somewhere where you can, you can have water um, poured in and it sits in the base. So the important thing is the worms, obviously. You, you've <laughs> got to have worms for your worm farm. And I think for most people, the best thing to do is to actually go and buy some worms. I know that sounds a bit crazy, but there are particular worms which do very well in worm farms. Tiger worms are regarded as ideal. And you can actually buy them. You can buy boxes of them at um, nurseries and places like that. So I'd recommend people investing in a, a box of worms. I know it sounds a pretty weird thing to do. It's amazing. So, I bought actually a box when I started it. Um, I built yeah. my own worm farm and I bought a box and they're just awesome. I just love it. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, once you, Indian once blue, worm, I think they call, they're like, uh, yes, they're not only one worm. It's worm. Like, <laughs> yeah. But you've got, to, you've got to have the right ingredients. Of course, you've got to feed them. It's a bit like feeding the microorganisms in your composting system. And worms will eat pretty much anything. Uh, I know there's a bit of um, sort of concern about feeding them things like onion skins and citrus, and you probably, you might tend to avoid that with worms. So don't like anything too acidic. Um, and also uh, they probably won't do terribly well on eggshells and those sort of things, but anything, basically anything organic. So any, any um, kitchen scraps certainly will, should be fine. I wouldn't be putting meat or fish or bones or anything in your worm farm, but all your organic material, and that can include um, things from the, from the garden as well, you know, weeds or leaves and so forth. The other essential ingredient is, is keeping it moist. And it's probably a good idea to have some sort of cover, um, like a, it could be a piece of hessian or even a few layers of paper, just to keep the, the top of the, uh, the box, whatever it is, moist so that the worms don't dry out. I had a terrible experience with a worm farm when I started. Got this beautiful worm farm, set it all up, gave them all their lovely food, but I'd forgotten to put it in shade. And we had this incredibly hot weather. And unfortunately, of course, the, the worm farm, well, it basically, they boiled. Yeah. They boiled yeah. alive. They, yeah. they all died. So you've That's got to be very for, You can't really put them in a sunny space because they literally cook alive in the heat of Australia. At least. Right. Um, mm. I had them yeah. in the end um, in the garage because they seem yeah, to be so it's, it's, uh, actually it the... Really, yeah. It's it doesn't matter where they are, as long as they're not exposed to excess heat, I agree. Now, the other thing that's important is, uh, as I said, to keep, the, to keep it moist. So you, it's good to add the, the water, or usually water is what you're adding every, you know, every little while. But the other thing that's important is um, to drain off the, the moisture from what, they, what happens is you get a lot of juice being produced. Well, sometimes people call it worm juice. Um, okay. and or worm we or whatever it, it, it collects in the bottom of your um, worm farm now depending on what what it's made of and how it's structured some of them have got little taps on them the commercial ones and you can just turn on the tap and it comes out and you can collect it in a bucket if it's you know just a, a tub or something you need to have an outlet you need to have something which can you can drain it away otherwise the whole thing will become very boggy boggy and what the worms do is they basically work their way through the material. So if you put them in a, in a layer of uh, organic material, they'll, you, they'll work their way up through that and then they'll, they'll go to the next level if you've got another level. So if you keep adding the material on top, they'll just eat their way through that. And what they leave at the bottom is this, um, well, it's really their feces, I suppose. It's worm cast, as it's sometimes called. It's, they, they basically consume the organic material and excrete the leftovers. And that's what they call um, the worm cast. And that's wonderful fertilizer for your garden. So basically you keep on adding uh, material to the top and you keep taking it away from the bottom, both the liquid and the solids. Um, and you don't, as I say, leave them out, out in the sun, which is disastrous. Um, eventually they, they might die off. I mean, they're not, they're not um, immortal of course but it's amazing they, they also reproduce i think in the in the worm farm so ideally you can keep that worm farm going for years if you if you look after them um, but remember if you go away for a holiday or you're not able to to do the work for a for a while um some, some you'll have to find a way of of protecting them from dehydration maybe 
just make sure they're in the shade and or even inside somewhere. Uh, best, it's best though to have somebody come and check it out every every few days or every week, um, because if you neglect them, they'll they won't perform. So that's your worm farm. Yeah, I know there's like you know the warehouse or Bunnings, what you or not, you can buy these ones. Um, they I think they're three layered, so pretty much the worms yep. with the food on top, and then yep. there's like a middle bit, and then it drains down to the bottom, and you have a tab. I also yep. built one with actually two broccoli styrofoam boxes from uh, Coles, where yep. I put holes on the lid and holes in the bottom, and put some uh, paper. And then um, the, the juice went into the bottom. The only thing is, if you don't have a tab, it's actually hard because the box on the top gets really yep. heavy and the bottom yep. one is not so heavy. And sometimes they'll fall yeah. through and drain in their own juice, which was also not so great. Um, yeah, and then what you said before, I think an old bathtub, if that would drain out of the drain, literally, yes. and you could catch it I mean, you can, you could make a little um, output just with a piece of plastic tubing, or you could even get a tap you know, you can get those um, taps which uh, they use in um, large water containers. You can buy those separately and you can mm. possibly add that to the... Anyway, I mean, there are various ways of adding a tap or a, an outlet to... You're right. Yeah, I it's found it really bad. amazing because right. I learned that... Um, so pretty much if you want to take something, if you want to use some of the soil that they also produce, so their feces, they actually don't like light. So you take a heap out okay. and then... Um, in the light and then they go all to the bottom and then you can yes. just like scrap the top off and use it and um, I think it's quite potent um, I think it's yes. possibly yes, it more is. potent than um, a normal compost right oh um, yes and yes, so I think I you can even dilute the their, their, the juice you can dilute it with water even even further because it's just so yeah. potent so yeah. why is this good yeah. for your garden why is it good? Well, I mean, essentially what it's doing is it's delivering a, a sugar hit of, of high nitrogen content. I mean, because plants need nitrogen. So we have our own um, juice that we get from our composting system, which we called West Brunswick Gold. <laughs> we, we decant it from the um, composting system into a, well, it goes into a sump and then we put it into large containers and then we put it into milk bottles. And that's, that's a high nitrogen um, additive, if you like, it's like a tonic for the garden. I think the the worm we or the worm, worm juice is even more potent, even more concentrated. We work on a, a rough formula of about twenty to one. So if you're if you're watering it down, if you're diluting it for putting on, say, seedlings um, or even seeds that have been planted, you'd want to say put half a liter in a in a in a ten liter um, watering can. So if you don't if you don't dilute it. It's, it's pretty strong, it's very concentrated. So um, you could theoretically put it straight onto a large established tree, but I'd, I'd be inclined to, to water it down. Um, and with the, the worm we from the, the worm farm, you really have to water that down. If you put that on meat, it'll just about kill the plants because it's so potent. But it's, it's a fantastic source of nitrogen for plants. It's really, and Why I don't- Why do plants need nitrogen? They need nitrogen to grow because it's essential to it's like um, the fuel for them to create their, um, uh, I think, I, I'm not sure if it's essential to photosynthesis, but it's certainly essential to, to cell growth and, um, Leaf growth. and, and, and growth, growth generally. So it's, it's absolutely, and that's why, for example, commercial fertilizers, you'll see things like superphosphate. That's got a, that's, that's a, got a lot of nitrogen. You'll often see on the packet PNK, which is, Phosphorus, uh, uh, potassium, nitrogen, yeah. and um, potassium, um, and that's uh, and depending on the ratio, it depends on how much nitrogen is actually being delivered. So you've got to be aware that certain plants like like a certain ratio, and you can find that out from. I think horse manure is really high in nitrogen. I put that in the compost before as well. Yeah, all those all those animal manures, as I said before, the trick with those is not to put them on meat. So you don't just go around behind the horse and collect it as it drops. You've got to put it out on a bit of a um, pile somewhere or you can cover it over and let it mature for a while so it becomes less acidic yeah. and then add it to the compost. It's fine. It's very good. I mean, it's, And so it's why is it important to mix your compost um, 
in in your garden bed uh, apart from the nitrogen what what else does it do to your plants and your vegetables well essentially it's as i said before it's like a soil conditioner so you can either you can certainly just put it on the surface but there are a couple of problems with that a it's not doing its real job by air conditioning or central you know centrally sort of conditioning the, the all the soil so you need to dig it down at least a spade depth to make it really a potent and also you can be in danger of creating a mulch or even a, like a coating over the surface if you put let's put your, your compost straight on the surface because it's it's pretty often pretty fibrous um, or can be um, it'll act as a bit of a, a barrier for, for, for water and so what you want to do is you want to mix it in so it mixes in with the soil and it's it's basically creating a an ideal combination of with the soil soil doesn't matter how how your soil is constituted i mean it depends on what your soil is like and it's a good idea to do a ph uh, to do a, a soil test or ph test on your soil to find out how alkaline and how acidic it is but also have a look at the composition of your soil is it very is it very sandy is it very clay and, and that can be um uh you know important in to determining um what what will grow there so um it's not just a matter of the acidity or the alkalinity. Um, there's a very good book which um, I bought myself by a former CSIRO soil chemist. Um, I'm trying to remember the title of it, but we've got a we've got a reference to it on our. I can send it to you anyway, and it's just a very simple explanation in lay terms of the very complex chemistry of, of soil and what what you need to do to 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 create really good soil um and uh because so the importance good. of good soil is obviously also that your vegetables have um what i wanted to get to is that they actually also have the nutrition that once you eat it that you also going to get the nutrition and that's why you need good soil right yes well i think it's it's a combination of things that's right if you've got poor soil the plants won't thrive <coughs> the, the vegetables or fruit or whatever it is won't won't be optimum and of course, the the end product will be deficient. So, I mean, ideally, what you do, you want to do is create the optimum conditions for each particular uh, type of plant, and they they will vary depending on certain plants like different conditions. But you can almost universally say that adding compost to any soil, doesn't matter what you're growing, is is beneficial. It'll be beneficial to the soil and be beneficial to the plants and be beneficial to you so it's it's good all around now i'm going to say goodbye awesome. now i just I, want to say I good finishing words yeah <laughs> <laughs> well enjoy your working bee um and yeah i don't know like libby or richard like is there anything that i haven't asked you that you just want to share because you, you think that's something imp of importance to know no, but we welcome we welcome anybody to come down to our community garden and to find out how we operate and even possibly join us as a as a member. But we but even just out of curiosity, come down, see how we do it, ask questions. We're always happy to share uh, our knowledge and uh, and you'll anybody who comes along will probably have something to offer us as well. So it's always a good a good uh, you know experience for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. So much to. Yeah. I agree. Community yeah. gardens are amazing. I'm going to say. If you've got any now. interest, get involved. I would just, yeah. Um, I always ask like a last question. So um, even through your work or as personal, like, is there like a message from your heart, um, you know, and soul that you want to share that you think is important for um, the world to know? <laughs> <laughs> What a big question. Um, <laughs> um, I think one of the things that Community Garden has given me is a an ability to feel like I'm doing something. And I think for those amongst your listeners who will share concerns about our current climate and environment crisis, um, this is an opportunity to connect with like-minded people and to be doing something. I think, you know, if, if you're at all involved in the environment space or have any passion for changing the way that the world works and thinks about our impact, um, 
they're all really big projects with really long ranging goals that you make micro advancements on. But this, you turn the compost and the compost turns out to be amazing. And you put it in the soil and you grow something. It's really solid, uh, tangible, beneficial impacts. You can see it in the people around you. You feel it in the community that you've got and you, you have a tangible result for your input. And I, I can't stress the value of that for, for people. Um, and, you know, in our, in our lives generally, so much of what we do doesn't have tangible physical bent. Like, I achieved this, I grew this. The amount of excited photos we've got of people holding carrots or tomatoes or whatever it might be, because there's so much joy and it really brings joy and it brings people together. So if you've got an interest, get in touch with your community garden, even if you only come, you know, a couple of times a year. You've, there's heaps of them around. Go out and find it. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time and um, your buzzing garden and uh, you're doing a working bee today. So, yeah, it's ah. So it's good. Um, it's such a beautiful garden. And yeah, I can encourage everyone to um, wherever you are in the world, just um, learn some gardening, at least just something because it's, yeah, it's definitely rewarding for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much for your time, Lena. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.